open up the floodgates A mighty river flowing from your heart Filling every part of our praise Your presence in this place Your glory on our face We're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Here we go. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Welcome to Grace Valley Church and happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. We are glad that you are here worshiping with us. If you would go ahead and take a moment, say hello to your neighbor and we will be right back. If you would go ahead, if you would go ahead, have a seat. So we had VBS this last week. It was an amazing experience. Thank you to all the volunteers uh, who helped out. There were so many of you and you uh, did an amazing job. The kids had a blast. Um, for those of you who weren't here, um, we have a recap video that we would love to show you. And, uh, and then we'll be right back.
It was a big, fun week at VBS uh, this week, so thanks for letting your kids be a part of that. And for all of you and for everyone who volunteered to make this week happen, would you please give them a big round of applause. Let's thank all of our volunteers, our staff, our uh, kids team, everybody that helped make it happen. It was an awesome uh, week. You saw in that video uh, me getting pied in the face. So there's always this thing that happens at VBS where we are trying to raise money for a mission, and, and so... They always put my face as the reward if they raise enough money. And so they were, the goal was uh, $2,000. They raised almost $3,500 uh, towards a very special mission, not only to get me a pie in the face, which actually happened, or, uh, but we also got to raise money for uh, a ministry called the Levite School. And this is Joe Wakabi. Joe goes to our church, and, uh, and he started a school in Uganda where he is from. And he's going to tell you briefly a little bit about the Levite School and uh, what our mission's money is going towards. So... Thank you, everyone. Um, again, I truly appreciate parents letting your kids be a part of living for something other than themselves. Uh, for most of kids, uh, a lot of times they think about candy and, and shoes, but then you give them an opportunity to think about people who uh, don't look like them and have a ton of needs. So what this is, this is an opportunity that came to me while I actually led VBS in my village. There was no VBS. And so as the kids came to VBS, uh, many of them were Muslims. And uh, I asked God, give me an opportunity for me to build a school whereby there will be a Christian teacher to stand in front of these kids for at least eight hours a day. Now, that was about 20 years ago. This February, we opened up the school. It's called the Levites Academy. And uh, it's not just a typical school. It is an integrated Christian school. See, Uganda is one of the youngest nations in the world where half the population is literally below the age of 15. That comes with a ton of unemployment. So as Christians, I figured our best way to address such a need is to present an opportunity for kids, number one, to live biblically. Because most of the ethical things in life, there's no way you can define them without scripture. But also to provide them an opportunity uh, to learn a skill. So on top of the traditional education, we are allowing kids to learn a trade school. And as a matter of fact, the money that was contributed is going to help us finish uh, the technical building that we are actually building. So I truly appreciate the opportunity uh, for Grace Valley to partner with us. Uh, most of these kids you will never see or even know, and they will never know who you are. But in the grand scheme of things and discipleship, we are helping impact the world. So I, that is something that is truly special for me. So thank you so much, Grace Valley. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, we, we have 15 acres of land, and so we have animals on the property because we are thinking about self-sustenance. And um, I, I told the earlier service that because of this contribution, you get naming rights to two of the goats that are on the property. <laughs> that is incredible. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for your vision and your heart to serve uh, uh, your, your village and your uh, home nation of Uganda. And we're honored to be able to uh, partner with you. And we can't wait to see more and more uh, of what happens there. So uh, really exciting week at VBS. And uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for all you parents who wrote checks that resulted in me getting a pie in the face. I just want to say thank you for that. And thank you really, for truly, for giving towards missions. Um, we're excited about what God is doing, uh, not just in our church, but around the world. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to continue worshiping together this morning. We already had a great baptism in our first service, uh, but it's Father's Day. So let's, uh, let's worship together and, uh, and let's sing. All throughout my history, faithfulness has walked beside me. 
the winter storms made way for spring and every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak, fear may come but fear will leave. And you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life All over my life Cross the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. All over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my. All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life All over my life So why should I Goodness of God. 
just like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. faithfulness and goodness. His goodness and faithfulness ultimately starts and finishes by what he did on the cross for us all. This is a song we are called to sing in every season of life, through a valley or coming out of one. Psalms 145 verses 1 through 3 says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable.
pray with me. Father, we come to you this morning, God. We want to say that uh, loud and clear, that you are worthy of it all. Uh, Everything in our lives is due to you, and God, we want everything in our lives to glorify you. And so, God, I pray that you lead us this morning. I pray that you make uh, the scriptures come alive to us. I pray that we understand your will for our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Father's Day to all of you, and uh, I hope that you're having a great day. And it's funny how differently we treat Uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day, um, I had several fathers come to me and say, yeah, it's just another day. And uh, 
which we know is not true dads. Uh, you're to be honored, and, um, and it's really important for us to take time to honor those uh, around us. But I also want to make sure and say this. We say this very um, intentionally on Mother's Day, but we sometimes forget this is also true on Father's Day. Some of you, Father's Day um, comes with it some pain and some difficulty and some struggle because of whatever scenario you may be in. You may have lost your father. Um, I'll talk about my dad here in just a moment. Lost my father a few years ago. Uh, so, so some of you, today's a bittersweet day or a difficult day. Uh, others of you long to be a father and you've not been able to become a father. And so this day has its uh, set of struggles with it. Um, and maybe you don't have a great relationship with your dad or you're a father and you don't have a great relationship with your kids. Um, I don't want to overlook those things in anyone's lives. And so, uh, so my prayer today is for every dad uh, to feel honored and to know that God is a heavenly father and he sees you and he knows what's best and he cares about your situation, uh, whatever uh, situation you're in. And so today I want to honor you. And on, on that note, I do want to honor my own dad. Um, I have a, a, I've had a great relationship with my dad all my life. I, I, I'm so grateful to be able to give a testimony that uh, I hear people talk all the time about how they had a difficult relationship with their dad, especially men having a, a hard time with their dad or having a conflict or ha- having a wound created by their father. I just can't say that. I had a spectacular dad. He was always there. I could count on him and any time I needed him, I could call him. He'd always answer. He showed up at every ball game, every, th- every event, every major moment in my life. He was there. He was present. Um, I had a, an exceptionally great father. And uh, I'm sad today because he's not, no longer with us. Um, he died a couple years ago um, in February of 2021, and we miss him. Um, but I'm grateful because my dad uh, really poured a lot into me and into my siblings. And so uh, we're, just, we're just blessed to have known him. Um, but some of, you, uh, some of you know my dad or knew my dad. Um, my dad was a, a wonderful guy. Uh, he was a contractor. That was what he did for a living. In fact, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure he knew how to do anything else. That's what he did. He was really good at being a contractor. There's hardly a, a week that goes by in my life that I don't run into somebody around our town that says, oh, I remember your dad. He was the most honest, straightforward, respectable contractor out there, which is like saying a lot for most contractors. Like they put him on a pedestal, and, uh, and I'm honored that that's his reputation. Um, but I grew up with this great relationship with my dad, and like most dads, this is kind of our deal, dads. We have a lot of influence and a lot of power, um, and most dads, I don't know what it is, God gives us this very special anointing. God gives dads an anointing to tell dad jokes. It's like an amazing thing. I was going to, have you heard the one about the paper? I was going to tell it, it's, but it's terrible. <laughs> Paper's terrible. Okay, uh, okay. I try, I try, okay. So, but dads do that thing, they do the thing. They have the jokes and the, and the one-liners. My dad was the king of one-liners. Uh, I remember growing up, if I heard anything, I heard my dad say to me, Andy, don't overload the mule. That was like his line to me. And, and dads, we do this. See, we, we, Nothing's new under the sun, but we go and we hear these things, right, as we're coming up, and we hear these things, and we go, ooh, I'm going to tell my kids those things. And they become these infamous lines that we say. Every dad does it, and you probably have the things that your dad taught you and told you, and I have them too. My dad said this line to me over and over, Andy, don't overload the mule. He knew that I had a tendency to do too much, overload the mule. And I heard it all growing up. The one, and I always hated this one because it was always in the middle of me complaining. He would say, Andy, can't never could. Oh, of course you're right, Dad. Can't never could, right? But the one that I have actually learned a lot from and have grown to love is my dad would do so just the setting of this one. We'd be on a construction site because I grew up in construction. My job was grunt work guy. I was a manual labor guy all the time. My dad would drop me off at a job. He would say, clean it up. And then he would leave. <laughs> and then he'd come back a few hours later, and I would have cleaned up the construction site. And so he says, clean it up. So, and then he would be like, we'd be mapping out a problem because I worked with my dad as a, like a kid and a teenager. And then a few years ago, started working with him again up until the point that he passed away. And so I had this privilege to work alongside my dad in this construction field. And so there would be times, even when I was a teenager or even m- more recently, where we'd be on a project or a job, and he would, he would be explaining what we're going to do here to me or to the subcontractor, to the guys. And he would say, there's a right way, a wrong way, and a savage way. And then he would expect us to all say this in unison. We're going to do things 
the savage way. And he would sort of say it like that. Very, very difficult to hear. And, uh, but he would say, he would say, we're going to do things the savage way. And this is, my, this is what I've learned about this line. He said it so many times growing up. He said, because there's always going to be somebody, no matter what you do, that's going to say this is the right way. There's always going to be someone on the other side who's critical of everything you do and say it's the wrong way. My dad was teaching me, you take ownership of whatever you do because your name is on it. This is, you do it the savage way. You do it the way that reflects on your name. You take responsibility for your actions. That's what he taught me. And so we did things the savage way. And we took ownership of that whole situation. That was just my dad. That's how he taught us. He gave us these like one-liners. My other favorite one was we'd be working on some project. I said, what do we do when we get done, dad? He would say, well, jog in place. Like, he just expected work. He just wanted you to work hard all the time. That was just how it worked. But that whole thing. So I was thinking about that, thinking about my dad coming into this, this Sunday. And I was thinking about this, this line, the right way, the wrong way, and the savage way. And then I was thinking about our series that we're in. We're in this series called Zeal. Zeal is this word that really invokes this idea of genuine enthusiasm. Like taking something very seriously being fully involved, fully invested in something, to be zealous for something. So really, I think if I were to learn from my dad and then sort of bring it into what we're talking about today, I would say maybe God would say there's a right way, a wrong way, and the Jesus way. Do things the Jesus way. Because you know in our culture, in our world today, there will be some people that will say they have the right way. There'll be some people who will always criticize you and say, it's the wrong way. But what God has called us to is his way. And when we open our Bibles to Romans 14, we're going to find one of the ways that we're to live. So as you turn to Romans 14, I want to share with you this idea of the way, the way that we're to do things. Um, it, it's very interesting. Acts chapter 9, I'm just going to read this to you. Don't turn there. Just make your way to Romans 14. But in Acts chapter 9, it says, Meanwhile, Saul, this is Saul before he became Paul. He was the one who persecuted the church in that first century. He said, uh, While Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest uh, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Saul was this very zealous Pharisee, a leader among the Jewish people, and he was persecuting all these people who had claimed to follow Jesus. And so he got special permission to go hunt these people down. He was, it was very much like that. He was going to hunt them down, and he referred to them by a title, people belonging to the way. You find that in the New Testament a, a few times where Believers in Jesus referred to themselves as followers or people belonging to the way, followers of the way, which brings up partly how Jesus taught us to think. Jesus in uh, uh, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's kind of an interesting title that we would see ourselves as followers of the way. And so when Jesus uses this, for this, this phrase, the way, or the understanding of New Testament believers being called followers of the way, there's three things I want you to think about. This is like vitally important. Please write these down. First thing that comes to mind is the way of salvation. Jesus described himself as like a door or a gate or a gateway. The only way to receive salvation, forgiveness of sins, is to come through Jesus. It's a very exclusive claim. No one else can offer you salvation. There's no other way that you might be saved from your sins. It's the only way to find favor with God is through Jesus Christ. So Jesus described himself as the way to salvation. So salvation is the first word. The second is the way of transformation. Romans 12 tells us, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The idea is that not only is there a way of salvation, there's a whole life on the other side of salvation that is the way to live your life. In other words, as believers and followers of Jesus, as disciples, we're going to grow up in our salvation and we're going to be transformed into God's plan and destiny for our lives. We're going to take on the way we're to live. 
So much of the, the New Testament epistles, the, most, of the, most of the books of your Bible in the New Testament are dedicated to the way you're to live and the, the way you're to conduct yourself as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. So there's the way of salvation, the way of transformation, and then there's, this one never gets talked about, the way of expectation. See, followers of the way, followers of Jesus, learn this incredibly important truth, that when you have an eternal hope, then you don't have to get everything now. You don't have to live for this world, and you don't have to live for anyone in this world because you have a hope and an expectation of the life to come, which is so important because we can get caught up in this world thinking, if I don't make it happen now, I'll never fully experience life. See, followers of the way didn't feel that way. They were very willing to sacrifice things in this world because they knew they had a future hope in the, in the next life. So these are the three things that sort of make up followers of the way. People who understand Jesus is the way of salvation, he is the way of transformation, and he is the only future expectation that we can have in, in, in eternity. So this title, Followers of the Way, sort of held on to believers. That was their title. Even in culture, people referred to them as followers of the way until in Antioch, there was a city in, in the New Testament called Antioch, where some people were making fun of Christians. Go figure, people would do that. They were making fun of these Christians, and they used the phrase Christian to make fun of them. It was a, a jab. It was a, a, a way to, to kind of d discourage and try to take away from them. He said they were calling them little Christ. And that's what Christian means, is little Christ. And so it was kind of a derogatory term, but then it took hold. And so the term Christian described followers of Jesus for pretty much all of church history, Christian history, up until today. Most people who believe in Jesus will refer to themselves as Christians. But here recently, I'm sure you've picked up on this, the culture we live in doesn't really like the term Christian. You probably have friends who believe in Jesus and they've shocked you by saying they no longer want to be a Christian. You hear people defecting from their faith or leaving the faith and it's really shocking to you because they're saying they don't want to be a Christian. And I think there's kind of two people that make up that camp. There's some people that don't like the term Christian because they feel it associates them with a group of people that they believe are hypocritical and they, you know, what the, the people who have done wrong in their Christian beliefs, they don't want to associate with these hypocritical Christians. So they don't like to associate with the term Christian for that reason. They might actually believe and follow Jesus. They just don't want to be associated with some of the characteristics of this group that tend to be hypocritical or have a lot of failure, don't seem to follow the ways of Jesus, and so they don't want to associate with that group. You've probably met people like that. I think there's another kind of person that doesn't want to be called a Christian. It's people who want Christianity completely on their own terms. In other words, they don't want the truth or the accountability of the Christian faith. They want to be able to say, I love and follow Jesus, but I'm going to pick and choose the, the truths I follow and the ones that I don't. And I think in our culture, we have both of those and we have a lot of people in the middle sort of trying to blend the two. And so, because our culture doesn't really like the term Christian, it's becoming less and less of a title people want to take on. And I've heard lots of people say things like, well, I love Jesus, I just don't want to be a part of a church or be a part of a group like that. I just don't want to be associated in those ways. And so I understand that. So here's what I'd like to do today. I would like to give everyone in here permission to no longer refer to yourselves as Christians. Yes, you heard it here first. You no longer have to call yourself a Christian. Every single person in here, you are free not to call yourself a Christian. In fact, I think it might actually be a good idea to stop using the word. But, please hear this. But if you're a follower of Jesus, call yourself a follower of the way. Let's just go back to the original title, Followers of the Way. That's clearer now 
Since our culture is so convoluted around what is a Christian and what isn't a Christian, who is a Christian, we have all these questions. What does it really mean to be a Christian? Let's just do this. Let's just go back. Let's just all be followers of the way. We follow Jesus. We follow his way, the only way of salvation. We follow his way, the only way to be sanctified or transformed, the only way to have eternal life and eternal hope. We trust in Jesus. We are followers of the way. That's a little more clear, isn't it? We are followers of Jesus. Which brings us to Romans chapter 14. If we're gonna truly be identified as followers of the way, we are in a constant quest to learn the way we're to live. How do we truly follow Jesus? What does that really look like? Now, we're gonna jump into a very important conversation happening in Romans chapter 14. It is critical that you remember a couple of things as we get into this. First of all, Paul is describing how followers are to treat other followers. He is not talking about your relationship with those who do not follow Jesus. He is talking about fellow follower relationships is what he's talking about. When you take, it, when you take this discussion outside of that understanding, it doesn't work. This is family business taking place in Romans 14. That's very important. And I want you to remember that we are going to walk into some pretty sticky issues. So hang on. Romans 14, verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, this is really important. Paul opens up this chapter talking about disputable matters. This is really important language because a disputable matter are matters of faith-oriented preference over non-essential matters. Issues, non essential to salvation or non essential to righteousness. Because we all know there are things in the Bible that we're just not sure how to handle. There's some things in life that the Bible doesn't directly talk about. You've all had those questions brought to you. Somebody says, Well, is such and such in the Bible? And you're like, I don't think so. I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know where that is in the Bible. And so we have this, this reality that there are gray areas. In life, there are specific things, issues that happen that the Bible doesn't directly speak about. And we've got to learn how to handle these gray areas. So I've always used this principle. To understand how to deal with gray areas, let the black and white of Scripture clear up the gray. So someone might say, well, that's not in the Bible, so we don't have to, the Bible doesn't speak on that. Well, that's not entirely true. Just because the topic isn't listed in the Bible as we find it in our culture in our day, there's enough black and white in scripture to guide us through those issues. So if your personality, by the way, today, if you have a personality that just leans towards being more black and white, this might be a difficult discussion for you. Because the reality is, there are gray areas. There are disputable matters, which is why Paul is addressing it. So number one, I want you to write this down. The way to handle the gray, number one, Differences regarding non-essentials is okay. Now, when I say non-essentials, do you guys hope you understand when I say non-essentials, we're not talking about is Jesus the Son of God? That's an essential belief. You you are a, if you say Jesus, he may not really be God. You've departed from orthodox teaching. You are not you are no longer in the realm of of biblical teaching and right teaching about Jesus. And so over non-essential issues, essential truths, they stand. But there are debates sometimes over these non-essential things. So Paul is saying differences regarding non-essentials is okay. It's going to happen. There's going to be differences. We have differences in our church. Not everybody believes every little issue the same. And so here, Paul says in verse 2, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, But another person whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does, uh, one who does not, and the one who does eat, excuse me, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. So Paul brings up this issue of eating meat versus vegetables. Most of us, most scholars believe that they're talking about meat sacrifice to idols. So that was a common practice of that day. There would be these pagan religions, false gods. They would worship. They would sacrifice an animal. Someone's cooking beef. 
And some people feel free to eat the meat. After all, it's cooked. Some people go, oh, no, 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 no. That was sacrificed to a false god. We can't touch it. A difference on a disputable matter. And so here in this case, Paul says, the person whose faith is strong says, I can eat the meat. The person whose faith is weak says, I can't eat the meat. Paul says, don't judge each other. Don't judge each other over these things. God has accepted each person's perspective. It's amazing that God has the grace to handle these kind of differences. So the issue here is judgment. So we debate on similar things. We may not debate over meat versus vegetables or meat sacrificed to idols. I hope you're not living in a neighborhood that does a lot of animal sacrifice. I think Carville would have a problem with that. You'd be breaking some code. I'm sure neighborhood would not like that. But as, as Jesus followers today, we disagree about a lot of things. Sometimes food, alcohol, musical preferences, political parties, cultural issues like the COVID vaccine, the war in Ukraine, sending your kids to public or private schools. And that's just stuff I've heard you guys talk about here in our church. Yeah, that's internal. That's here at Grace Valley. I've heard y'all talk about this stuff. It's out there. I hear, hear rumblings in our church. I'm not on social media, so I don't get to hear y'all argue about it on social media. But people do tell me things. These are things we argue about today. There's a tendency in all of us to take a disputable thing and elevate it to the level of an essential. And that's when it starts to feel like a war. So how do we do this? Number two, judgment and condemnation over disputable matters is not okay and not helpful. Paul just says this, don't judge over the differences of opinion here. The judgment and the condemnation is not okay and it's not helpful. Contempt towards your fellow follower over non-essential issues is out of bounds. Have you ever had that thought about somebody? I can't believe they're doing that. You have that contempt or that judgment about them? You see a fellow church member and they're out in the community and they're doing something. Whatever that something is that you disagree with. And you're like, I can't believe them. How do they even call themselves a Christian? You've probably been there. That judgment just rises up inside of us because we feel like we're right. We feel conviction. We feel like we've made a decision. We feel strong about what we believe. And it turns into judgment and condemnation towards someone else. But that judgment is actually more clearly out of bounds than the non-essential issue. It's like clearly a sin. But the non-essential issue has room for debate. Romans 14, verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own minds. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. I love verse 5. He says, each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. It's the idea that we should have a conviction that is personal to us based on what? Did you see it six times in that passage? Based on your relationship with God. Based on bringing it before the Lord. So, number three, convictions related to disputable matters should be settled in your conscience before and with an audience of one. He uses in the Lord six times. In other words, whatever position you take on a disputable matter, you should come to that conclusion before God and with God. Under his guidance and with his help, you should come to that conclusion between you and God. And you should be convinced in your own mind. We should, we should kind of have confidence of how we walk through this life because of our relationship with God. And so we do this with an audience of one. And I love that phrase because it reminds us we don't live for other people's opinions. We live for the opinion of one God. We follow Jesus. I love this. In Galatians chapter 1, it says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? 
Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's how, how far Paul takes it. If I were trying to please human beings, then I would no longer be a servant of God. That is something that is absolutely incompatible. You cannot live to please people and be a servant of Christ. They do not, those waters do not mix. Which is part of the challenge that Paul is presenting for us is we should start taking notice of when we're making our decisions and living our lives to please people versus trying to please God. This is the push of scriptures to push us to say, no, we live for an audience of one. Which goes back to the way. This is why we need eternal hope. We need the expectation of the life to come because you will not say no to this world if this world is all you have. But if we have an eternal hope, then this world's not the end. And so I can live for something greater. So as I was preparing for this message this week, someone shared with me um, a series of tweets that were done probably a year and a half ago in the, in the, in the midst of COVID, in the middle of COVID. A prominent Christian personality put out several tweets regarding the COVID vaccine. And this is a very prominent person. I'm not going to share their name. But this person promoted this idea that if you're truly a Christian, if you're truly a Christian, then you will take the vaccine because of your love for your neighbor. And for you not to take your vaccine equals that you don't love your neighbor and you are somehow sinful. And it was this series of tweets, very aggressive, very strong. And the reality is, let me just tell you guys this, because I get this question sometimes. The COVID vaccine, as it relates to our faith, is a disputable matter. The Bible does not say anything about vaccines. It's a disputable matter. And the danger of what this author did was they were pushing one side of an issue and completely neglecting the scripture that teaches on how to do these things. The scripture is very clear that you're to settle these matters of conviction in your heart with God. Verse 13 says, therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. So Paul is talking about, how do we handle this stuff then? He says, you're to stop passing judgment. Make up your mind not to put a stumbling block in the way. So number four, the expression of your convictions on non-essential issues should be guided by love. It should be guided by love. So we should be caring about those around us. We should be loving other people around us, not to let our preferences become a stumbling block in the way of other people. Now, this is one of the reasons why I had to say up front that this is about fellow followers. This is not about the outside world. Unbelievers, the stumbling block already exists. Jesus identified himself as the stumbling block. He's the first hurdle of faith is that people need to deal with Jesus first. But amongst believers inside God's family, we can end up putting a stumbling block in the way, which was one of my issues with this person's tweets about the vaccine. She had taken an issue that I believe is a disputable matter. She elevated it to the point of an essential and then judged and condemned people based on her opinion. Rather than leading people back to the scripture to say, sort it out between you and the Lord. That's, that's what the scripture actually says to do, to sort it out. And then not to judge those who differ. And I don't care what side of the decision you're on, vax or non-vax, you could be just as guilty on either side because of judgment and contempt to the other side. That is clearly forbidden in the text. And so, 
Paul talks about this, and he actually encourages that when there's a chance to create a stumbling block, that you would consider laying down some of your freedoms for the sake of your brother or sister in Christ. Freedoms to talk about your decision. A lot of people feel very, and this is a, because this is an American concept, I have the right to talk about anything I want. Freedom of speech. Don't we all have the freedom of speech? Well, under Christ, we might not. We submit even that to Christ. Oh, you have the freedom to speak. On, on debatable issues, you might just need to keep your mouth closed. And we surrender that freedom to speak. Why? Because it could be a stumbling block for another believer. Where in this case, this Christian personality, I think she should have withheld those sweets. I think that would have been the wiser move. That would have been her keeping to her convictions and not casting judgment on anyone else. Because in certain circles, this is what happens. And this is what bothers me about it. Probably what bothers you about it. When these Christian personalities start weighing in on things like this in disputable matters, others in the body of Christ feel spiritually manipulated by these, these situations. And they're not encouraged to go back to the scripture to define what is right or to go to the Lord to figure out what is right. They're just sort of mindlessly following these Christian personalities, which, by the way, please stop mindlessly following Christian personalities. Can we please stop it? Can we please stop contributing to Christian celebrity culture? It's not good for anybody. There was only one Christian celebrity worth following, and they killed him. Jesus Christ. So we need, to, we need to go back to the scriptures. We need to go back and make decisions in the Lord. And whether you think your position on an issue represents strong faith, right? Some people, maybe, maybe it's this way. Maybe people who took the vaccine have a strong faith and those who don't have the vaccine have a weak faith. Well, then you should be patient with your brother or sister in Christ in their decision. Shouldn't judge, shouldn't condemn. You should be patient. Or maybe it's the other way. Maybe people who didn't take the vaccine, they have the strong faith, and the people who did take the vaccine, oh, they have weak faith. And what should you do? You should be patient with your brother or sister in Christ and not judge, not throw contempt on their, their lives. Trust the Lord in the process. Your convictions... Do not release you from caring for the edification of your fellow believers. There's two big things that go wrong when we get into these disputable matters. One is that we fall into the, the realm of contempt, which is what we talked about, the judgment and the contempt towards other ones. The other side is carelessness, that because I've made my decision that I'm careless with how I handle it, and I can just talk about it in any way I want, I can do whatever I want, and both are equally damaging and equally cause a stumbling block. So we have to be mindful on disputable matters that the way we handle it is very important because your influence is more important than your freedom. As a follower of the way, we have to understand we are always on mission, always. And the mission is greater than any one of us. And so our freedoms are submitted to the mission to what God has called us to. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24 says, Paul's quoting a kind of a common line from the day. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive, Paul says. So no one should seek their own good, but really for the good of others. So you get this idea that just because you have the freedom to do something doesn't make it right. Now we all sound like dads, don't we? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Yeah. That came from the Bible. Some of you have absolute freedom in a disputable matter to make a decision. You know you have that freedom, and you feel the freedom to, to walk in that decision. But that freedom, just because you have the freedom, does not mean it's beneficial. We have to ask the care question. How does it benefit those around me? How do I, how do, I do this? So, does this mean... You cannot ever express your freedom, freedom in Christ. Well, of course not. You can still express your freedom in Christ. We just have to ask some questions before we just go blasting out our opinions and our ideas. 
Romans 14, 22 says this. <clears throat> so whatever you believe about these things, these disputable matters, keep between yourself and God. I don't think the scripture could be more clear than that. Keep it between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is a sin. So number six, keep your convictions between you and God. Paul prescribes a pretty radical idea here. That your convictions on non-essential matters should be kept between you and God. There is not much that flies in the face of our culture than that right there. Because we live in a world that if you have an opinion and you have a social media account, you have absolute freedom to say whatever you want. Not as followers of Jesus. As followers, we surrender those freedoms to Jesus. He's, we're followers of his way. And non-essential issues, we keep our opinions between us and God. Can you imagine how that would change the world we live in? Just among Christians. I'm not talking about the outside world. This church, can you imagine what would be different if we did that? If we didn't judge one another because one family sends their kids to private school and another sends their kids to public school? What if we didn't debate about that? What if we said that's between them and the Lord? I have a friend who comes to our church <clears throat> And uh, he told me not long ago, he said, it's really hard to find good friends at church. I said, really? Because I actually kind of hear the opposite a lot. Most people feel very welcome, very connected here, very loved. He said, because it seems like every group of people I meet at your church, everybody drinks. And I'm in alcohol recovery. Hmm. I said, yeah, I can see why that would be hard. And so, you know, Paul referenced wine in the text. So I thought it'd be fun to talk about alcohol this morning. Y'all want to do that? Let's just talk about alcohol. <clears throat> Biblically speaking, alcohol, I'll go ahead and answer the question. Is alcohol, is it a sin to drink alcohol? No. Unless. So please understand the answer is no, unless. Unless the Lord has convicted you to say no. Many of my friends that are in alcohol recovery, they have had to draw a very hard line and say no. And it was, it was actually a decision birthed out of faith, believing God and following a process of being healthy and trying to live their best for Christ that they're gonna draw a line and say, I cannot drink alcohol. And so that's their conviction. And you know what's funny is most people who are in recovery, they model this whole idea of keeping their conviction between them and God. It's kind of built into the anonymous recovery process of not making a big deal about your recovery. You just sort of do your work, take your steps, and keep going. And so is drinking alcohol a sin? Well, no, unless the Lord leads in a different direction. Because anything not done from faith is a sin, the scripture says. Whoa, 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 Paul. So are you saying that if I don't make a decision in faith, even a decision that's not, quote unquote, a sin could actually be a sin? Yes. Oh, man, we are all in trouble. So, wait a minute. So you're expecting me to ask God every time there's a disputable issue? That's kind of what he's saying. So here's how it works. Before you take your selfie with your glass of wine, wine 30, <laughs> just ask God, hey God, I'm thinking of taking a selfie with me and a glass of wine, calling it wine 30, hashtag wine 30. <laughs> what do you think? I actually think the Holy Spirit has an opinion there. And I think that's between you and God to sort that out so that you can stand before God with a clear conscience and say, okay, this is my decision. Before you get together with your small group from Grace Valley and everybody brings drinks, ask God, 
should we drink tonight, God? Because I could easily just be the pastor and be everybody's dad and lay down the law and say, no drinking at this church. But that's me drawing lines the Bible doesn't draw. I can't do that. But the scripture does say, seek him, ask him. And if you go, oh, that sounds way too complicated. I'm not asking God every time I need to do this. Then I don't think you should drink at all. I don't think you should. Because your faith doesn't support that line of thinking. So I think we should be careful. Dad, it's Father's Day. Should you post a picture of that that bottle of bourbon somebody got you for Father's Day? Ask God. Do you think that's a good idea, God? Because here's what I believe God knows. God knows everything, right? So on your way to meet with those buddies from the church or on your way to hang out with your small group or on the way to the girls' night, the Holy Spirit knows who will be there. The Holy Spirit knows what's needed at that dinner or that gathering or that get-together. The Holy Spirit knows. Imagine if you asked him. And if maybe that night somebody is really hoping they can find a friend at this church and there was not a stumbling block in the way, that could be a game changer for somebody's life. So by the way, we're starting a new ministry. You probably heard of it. It's called Celebrate Recovery. It's a ministry. It's a recovery ministry based on biblical teachings that we're going to be starting here. It's like an AA-type meeting, but it's called Celebrate Recovery. We're going to be starting that in August. If any of you are interested in attending or helping lead it, I want to invite you to meet me in the front office after the service because I'd like to give you some information about it and pull you, we'll pull you together with the group that's going to be launching this because ministries like that are so helpful for people who have struggled with an addiction, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or any other type of addiction, emotional issues, or whatever, so that we can come around you as a church body and say, we want to care about you and walk with you in this journey. Galatians 5 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Isn't that what happens? Because we're so clinging to our freedom to do whatever we've decided, we end up provoking and envying other people. Other believers, other fellow followers. Which is why we get to number seven. Submit freedom to faith. Submit your freedom to faith. You know what's interesting is this is exactly what Jesus did. I'm going to read something to you. In Philippians chapter 2, says these words. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you're a fellow follower, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, one of, and of one mind. Do nothing, this is amazing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, your fellow followers, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, rather than holding on to his freedom, rather he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He did it first. And he's invited you, not just to be a quote-unquote Christian, He's invited you to be a follower of the way, the way Jesus did it. And I'm just wondering if you'd be willing today to trade in all your notions of Christianity and say, Jesus, 
I want to take up being a follower of the way. I want to truly follow you. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the fact that you laid your life down for us. You gave up your freedoms so that we might experience your grace and your love and your forgiveness, that we would have eternal life with you. And so, God, I pray that because of what you've done for us, God, that we would experience the way you want us to live. So, God, give us guidance, give us your grace as we understand how to live in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. opportunity to meet Andy or any of us on staff, we would love to meet you. We'll be in the, um, the front office area uh, after the service. And if you filled out an info card, you can bring that. We'll give you a free gift. If you don't want to see us at all, that is perfectly fine. My feelings are not hurt, but we have black boxes in the back. You can drop your info card in there. Um, and that's also where we take our tithes and offerings. If you came prepared to give of those, uh, if you did not, and you would like to give online, you can go to gracevalleymemphis.org slash give and set up online giving there. Um, I also want to let y'all know, um, coming up on July 2nd, we have a really special service on that Sunday. Um, it is a communion service. So for those of you that were here for the New Year's uh, service that we did, um, same type of thing. It was a really, really special experience. Um, families came. We were able to pray over them to, to lead them in communion. Um, and you don't want to miss this opportunity. It's a really special time for your family to get prayed over um, and uh, be able to take communion as a family. Uh, so that will be going on. It's a come and go event from 9 to 12 on July 2nd. So make sure you put that on your calendar for that Sunday. Uh, we look forward to taking part in that with you. Um, and I'm inviting uh, Rusty Parker up. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good. If you would, please stand as Rusty leads us in the benediction. All right. Reading comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations.